We've already had a lecture about stroke and TPA and stroke and EVT and stroke and those types of issues. This lecture is looking at posterior strokes and it comes into it from the I'm dizzy standpoint because this is one of the most common symptoms that's you know, misattributed and the person actually has a posterior stroke but they're hard to pick up. So it starts with the idea of dizziness and vertigo. And so to clarify, dizziness, is, you know, it's this grab bag term that includes things like lightheadedness, unsteadiness, motion intolerance, imbalance, floating, lifting. You know, we've all had that person. So um, what brings you in today? I'm dizzy. Hmm. Okay. And now we need to distinguish that from vertigo. And vertigo is a subset of that dizziness. And it's, it's a asymmetrical input from your vestibular system. And we have three main ways of figuring out where we are in space, right? We have our visual cues, we have our proprioception, and we have our inner ear to be able to pick up. It's like that little gimbal in there to figure out where we are in space. And if one, two, or three of those things aren't talking to each other correctly, we have vertigo. That's what we mean by vertigo. And then when we're talking about vertigo, we're often trying to separate peripheral from central. So it's a peripheral vertigo problem or a central vertigo problem. And if you just walk in the room, and I have to stay in my box, oh, and walk out of the room, right, 90 something percent of the time you're going to be correct without even seeing the patient because you can say, well, it's probably peripheral, right, because the vast majority are peripheral. But some of those central causes are life-threatening and dangerous. And so that's why we don't just walk out of the room and go, ah, you know, it's probably just peripheral. BPPV, right? And so we need to figure out who those people are with the life-threatening conditions. And, you know, in emergency medicine, we're there to see the common, right? But we're also there to pick out the life-threatening. And the classic example for that outside of your head would be in your chest. How many people do we see with chest pain? Every shift, chest pain, belly pain, chest pain, belly pain, chest pain. But chest pain is the classic example because very few of them actually rule in for an MI. But we're there to pick up those MIs. That's why you're there. All right, so this chapter is gonna take a look at the literature, specifically to start with a little bit about vertigo and then get into the actual posterior stroke treatment. So abstract number one is a single center chart review. And it's looking at patients that have isolated dizziness. Now it's a small group, it's just like 136 patients that are in this group. And, it, and it's sort of in line with the other literature saying, you know, the prevalence of stroke among dizzy patients isn't very high. Okay, it's less than 10%. In this study it was 4%. Now, 4% to my clinical experience of dizziness I don't see one in 25 people having a posterior stroke who come in with dizziness. At least that's me reflecting. And the reason that might be is that my experience is different than this study is because they had selection bias. They had workup bias. The only people that they figured out this or that got into this cohort were those who got an urgent MRI. Why don't get an urgent MRI in every single dizzy patient? And so this is a select group of people. And so it's probably a lower number if you consider the complete denominator of every patient that comes in with dizziness. They were selective and said, we're only in, gonna include the people that were dizzy that we also got a MRI urgently on. Abstract number two is a much larger study. You know, they're, they're looking at more than 2,000 patients with dizziness. And they said about a thousand of them, they, they, they had isolated dizziness, isolated vertigo, no CNS findings, no obvious sign of a stroke. And yet the stroke rate was about four and a half percent. So similar to the previous study. And you know what they found was uh, associated, because this is a chart review, that was associated with stroke? This will shock you. People that were older were more likely to rule in for a stroke. I know we're teaching you really groundbreaking stuff here. Thanks for coming and uh, having a second coffee for our nocturnist over there. Personalized service, you're welcome. But she told me yesterday I, I couldn't bring her a coffee because there's a, there's a very like special sugar to cream ratio, right? And so I just brought the cream and sugar over and let her doctor it herself. Um, 
But uh, also, you know what else was a predictor that was associated with it being a stroke this time? If they had a stroke before. You know, the best predictor of future behavior is past behavior. So if you've had a stroke before and you come in, you're more likely to have a stroke the next time. Right? It's an association, though. All right, abstract number three is another chart review. Low level of evidence on dizziness. But it adds a little, little interesting twist, perhaps, because they wanted to see if the D-dimer was connected to ruling in for having a stroke. And again, this study only included patients that were sent for an urgent MRI. So not all your dizzy patients. And despite this selection bias, right, it's still consistent with the other studies. It was around 3%. Around 3% who ended up getting an MRI with these dizzy patients had a stroke. And the D-dimer was higher in stroke patients. Do you think that makes a D-dimer a good test for stroke? I don't think so. I think it just a, it's a test of frailty maybe, comorbidities, renal dysfunction, generally unwell perhaps, right? And so I wouldn't hang my hat on a D-dimer on a dizzy patient to rule in or rule out a stroke. Abstract number four, though, is a database study from an academic stroke center in Turkey. And they reviewed seven years worth of data of dizzy visits. So this was more than 29,000 patients coming in and said, I've just got dizziness. And they were looking for whether it was central, whether it was not peripheral, but whether it was central. Could there be a stroke going on? And they found it was about a half a percent. Now, the diagnostic yield when uh, imaging was ordered, right, and this is when imaging was ordered, was about half a percent. And that, that would be sort of, you know, like that's, you know, one in 200. Okay, I get that for dizzy patients and stuff like that. But if they just said, okay, how about just the patients that we did the MRI on, look at that number. It's in your notes. It's around 4% again. So it's about a one in 25 chance that you're going to rule in for a central stroke-like cause if you get the MRI. So, from that sort of diagnostic and imaging and what's the prevalence and stuff like that, how about this HINTS exam? Have you guys done the HINTS exam? Okay, so, you know, the population that, that we're seeing with dizziness tend to be older individuals, um, tend, you know, and, and because of uh, sex differences, they tend to be older women, right? Older female patients that are kyphotic and osteoporotic, right? And so you're supposed to check this head impulse test. And I just, I just get a little nervous taking this, you know, five foot two, wonderful woman, raised children, grandchildren. She has great grandchildren. I'm just going to go to check her eyeballs and you know, and that's my, that's my own personal fear that I bring to the table. But anyways, the HINTS exam. Ooh. Head impulse, nystagmus, and test of skew. And it's become, you know, it, I'd say about five years ago, there was some really exciting data saying this is better than an MRI. And I was like all excited. Because so I was like, oh, I'm better than an MRI. You know, like this huge, big, loud, expensive machine, and I can walk in there and I can figure, I got more sensitivity than the MRI, right? So I was really encouraged by this. But when you look at the literature, the person who's better than the MRI is a stroke neurologist who runs a dizzy clinic, not the emergency physician who's going from patient to patient to patient going, oh, and then going seeing, you know, chest pain and belly pain and a sprained ankle and stuff like that. So most of that data came from a doctor named uh, David Newman Toker. And, uh, and, you know, really good in, in their hands. Better than an MRI. Maybe not so much in my hand. Well, I know it's not as good in my hands. I don't know about you guys. Abstract number five is from 2021. And they took emergency physicians and they and they carefully trained them to do the hints exam and they compared it to two other testing um, protocols something called standing and the abcd2 score to help differentiate between peripheral and central causes of dizziness and the results looked really good the hints exam showed a sensitivity so true positives of 97 percent in the hands of these well-trained emergency physicians so i'm thinking yes we can you know this is really good i'm going to scroll down past where it describes the hints exam they have those funny goggles in there for you i've seen youtube videos where people take their uh, 
cell phone cameras and have that super slow-mo where they can get right in there and you go, watch the nystagmus. Because it happens pretty fast, right? And so uh, they've got all those YouTube videos. So I'll let you look at those links. But Abstract uh, 5 was pretty promising, suggesting that we can do this very well. We can learn it. But a couple of recent publications said, hmm, are we that good? And so abstract number six is a systematic review done by some Canadian friends in northern Ontario, uh, Robert Ohl. Uh, and he looked at the sensitivity and specificity of the Hintz, Hintz exam. And when they mashed this stuff up, they only had one study that involved emergency physicians. The rest were neurologists. So they had five small studies in this systematic review. Four of them were straight up neurologists. One of them had emergency physicians in it. And the numbers weren't as impressive. 83% sensitivity in the hands of emergency physicians. So um, they say that uh, the Hintz exam by emergency physicians has not been shown to be sufficiently accurate to rule out stroke. And I would agree, I wouldn't rely on my Hintz exam to rule out a stroke in these patients. Now abstract number seven is a real world example of what happens when emergency physicians apply the Hintz exam in their practice. And I guess, Th this was done by um, the, the EM guru in Hints. His name is Peter Johns, and he's out of Ottawa. Again, I think there's some links in your show notes to YouTube videos. He has a YouTube channel. It is fantastic. He does all this stuff on dizziness and vertigo, and they're really, really good videos. And he's very enthusiastic about this area. So he wrote this abstract, number seven. And, and you know, the key point is that Hints is an only relevant in patients with constant vertigo for hours to days and active ongoing nystagmus. It's not for the patient that says, every time I turn my head that way, I get dizzy and then I turn it back and it's fine. That's not the person to do vertigo or to do the Hintz exam on. And so are we applying it in the right patients? And so this Canadian study, large chart review, Hintz exam was misapplied how many times? 97% of the time. Wow. So, you know, the previous study said, you know, we can train you to do the Hintz exam and you can do it well, right? And then if we look and what's happening, well, we're not doing it well, 83% sensitivity. And then when we look, are we doing it on the right patients? And it's only 3% of the time. We're actually doing that head impulse and test of skew and nystagmus test in the correct patients. So, of course, it's going to be misleading. It's information that's not going to help us and um, not be very specific or um, sensitive. So this is, uh, this is abstract eight. That's the, that's the Peter John's paper, sorry. And, um, and, you know, it is a useful test if you're doing it in the right patient population and thinking about the right people and doing it in that population. And so his bottom line is only use this in patients with active continuous vertigo and active pathological nystagmus on exam like constant nystagmus. I mean, when I come into the room, I remember the last person that I saw with this, and I come into the room, and there's his partner holding him up, and his eyes are just shaking on the bed, right? And, 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 and it's just constant. It's not like I had to lie him down, put his head back, turn to the right, lift one foot up. I'm making that up. But, you know, like the whole Epley maneuver and stuff like that. It was just constant in that sitting position, and it was going on for the last day or two. Right? And so that's the patient that this can become good at. And so the Hintz exam is like most exams. It's the Goldilocks zone, right? We don't want to you know, get a CT on every patient who has a headache, right? But we don't want to not get a CT on a patient who has a headache that's concerning. We want to get that advanced imaging on the individual that we think needs it, right? Same thing with the Hintz exam. You don't do it on every single person that says, I'm dizzy but you don't not do it, you wanna focus in on the people that could benefit from it. And those people are those constant vertigo people that you uh, see. So that's it for dizziness and vertigo. Now we're gonna get into the whole idea of um, posterior strokes and uh, what can we do for them in today's day and age. And you know from my previous lecture that stroke care has dramatically changed in the last five years. Endovascular treatment for large vessel occlusions and the anterior circulation has been quite dramatic and quite effective. Now, only a few people qualify for it, but it actually is a very powerful therapy, and it's been demonstrated to be that. 
But the concern is about what about the posterior circulation? Because they're always talking about anterior LVO EVT, right? Anterior circulation, large vessel occlusion, you know, some advanced scanning stuff now looking for salvageable penundrums and, you know, a small core size and collateral flow, but not talking about the posterior circulation. So this is specifically talking about posterior aspects. So abstract number nine is a retrospective review from a database over a four-year period from the Medical University of South Carolina. They had a total of four, uh, 59 posterior strokes compared with 380 anterior. So anterior is way more common, as you know. And they looked at their outcomes, and they were pretty equivalent. 43% had good neuro outcomes in both groups with interventional therapy, getting EVT. Interventional therapy. Wow, that, that, you know, 43%. That's pretty good. But it's a retrospective chart review, right? It's observational data. Another database, this is abstract number 10, five academic centers, so it's not a single center, so we're getting better level of evidence. But it's from India, so you wonder about external validity to our healthcare system. And they compared posterior strokes to anterior strokes with interventional treatment. They looked over a period of two and a half years. They got 1,500 patients who had anterior strokes and 200 plus. So one in six got interventional treatment. So again, this shows you that not every patient that comes in with a stroke, that's the denominator, right? And how about the posterior strokes? They had 400 plus strokes and 28 of them. So 28 out of 411 got intervention. But they're good outcomes and similar between both groups. Around 50% had good outcomes. Modified rank and scale score of zero to two at 90 days. So they conclude that if the, if the outcomes are similar, should we be doing this with our posterior stroke patients? So we've gone from a single center to a multi-center, five sites. Now we have a systematic review put together on this, and this is abstract number 11. The methods aren't great. Um, and they compared posterior to anterior circulatory strokes with large vessel occlusions using thrombectomies, and they confirm basically the previous two observational studies, but they did note that there was a higher mortality in the posterior strokes. Okay, so they, they had a higher mortality than the anterior strokes. They didn't do as well. They did as well neurologic outcome, but more people died. So the bottom line is observational data it says posterior circulation strokes due to large vessel occlusions um, seem to do well, just as well as the anterior. But what we'd like is higher level of evidence. And so that's the next section, going into randomized control trials. We want to know if you randomize people into getting this therapy or not, do they do well? Because we've been fooled by observational studies many times in medicine. And so abstract number 12 is the first large multi-center, randomized, that's the key word, trial of basilar strokes, and it was performed in China. They enrolled 131 patients, but the trial was stopped early. And they stopped it early because they said there was a lot of crossover, and they were having a hard time recruiting people into getting interventional therapy or not, control group, right, not getting the therapy. Now, they showed a 10% absolute benefit. So it was 32% if you didn't get EVT for your posterior circulation stroke, and 42%, so that's a 10% delta, number needed to treat of 10. It's pretty good. It wasn't statistically significant, but that's, the, that's, that's an important point. You know, there's a difference between statistical significance and clinical significance. I don't know, maybe a 10% difference in death, or sorry, in good neurologic outcome, would be clinically significant to your patient. But the other interesting part in here is, what did they use for good neurologic outcome? Did they use modified rank and score of zero to one, which has been used in a lot of stroke studies? Zero to two? No. They used zero to three. So of course, being the person I am, I went to their, you know, literature and dug into the paper and said, well, did they report zero to one and zero to two? And yes, they did. And uh, those were secondary outcomes and the standard zero to two, which is a pretty standard modified rank and score outcome, um, was uh, no difference, 33% versus 28% with a p-value of 
Okay? So it didn't look like there was any superiority to doing this. Abstract number 13, second large high-quality randomized control trial. It was called the BASICS trial. And now we're getting into multi-center, right? 23 centers, seven countries. Resources are going into figuring this out. Basilar artery stroke, treated within six hours. They were assigned to interventional therapy, EVT, or standard care. Modified rank and score of the outcome was zero to three. 44% versus 38% in the standard medical um, treatment group. That was a non-statistical difference. And the mortality rate was the same, so that's a bit reassuring to the observational data. But the secondary outcomes of zero to one or zero to two, no superiority, very tight, close together with the outcome. So it didn't look like there was any superiority to EVT for posterior strokes, even though the observational data was quite encouraging. Now, the question is, how do you interpret, you know, compare the observational data to the randomized control data? Those two trials that, we, that, that I talked about, the trials, right, the randomized control trials, they were underpowered. They had difficulty enrolling patients once people started figuring out that, hey, you know, this is supposedly working for anterior strokes. It was hard to maybe enroll patients into a placebo or a controlled group. And so there was an editorial uh, written and said, well, there's still hope here, right? They didn't prove that it didn't work in these randomized control trials. That's not how the null hypothesis works. They didn't demonstrate it didn't work. They just didn't prove superiority that it did work. And that's a really important distinction in epistemology. And so there may or may not still be a role in posterior strokes because in the anterior stroke circulation trials, you know what they did? They selected out the patients that they said, hey, there's salvageable brain there. They didn't do that in the posterior stroke studies, right? And so maybe there's some signal in that noise that you could tease out and pull out some patients. And so if you're working in your center and your stroke neurologist says, hey, I think this patient should go to the, um, and get EVT done, there might be a good rational reason for that because they've done advanced imaging and showed it's a small core size, there's good collateral flow, there's salvageable brain. And this is why time to brain is not an absolute paradigm. Somebody in this room unfortunately could have a stroke today and within 10 to 15 minutes, you could have dead brain. And no amount of opening up and pouring blood on dead brain is gonna raise that brain to life, like a Lazarus effect, right? But somebody could have a stroke, and 24 hours later, with really good collateral flow and the imaging techniques that they're using and the various scoring systems could say, there's something salvageable there, we can do EVT, and those patients actually do have potential benefit. So that's why it's not an absolute. Yes, time is important. We shouldn't be dragging our feet, but sometimes the die is cast by, by the time you see the patient. And so there is hope with this posterior stuff. So it may not be, what do you mean you're taking them for EVT? It's a posterior stroke. We don't have good evidence that proves that it works. Well, we don't, but they didn't select out the patients. They didn't screen those patients like they have been doing for the anterior circulatory stroke. All right, so let's see here. I'm finishing on time. Key points and recommendations. So if you've got a patient with isolated dizziness, they may be experiencing a cerebellar stroke. Yeah, it's a small percentage. Now, if you take the group that had the MRI, it's about four or 5%. If you take the people that didn't have the MRI, in other words, you, can, you look at the whole denominator, you don't have denominator neglect, it's every dizzy patient, it's less than 1%. Right, which would correlate to my experience. The HINTS exam became very popular for a while to identify um, you know, these central uh, stroke symptoms, but it's only useful if it's applied to the correct patient population, not just everybody with dizziness. Um, it's highly sensitive and specific for posterior strokes in the correct hands, and you can be trained to do this well. I mean, we do a lot of things well. We do a lot of procedures that we don't do very often that we can do very well, so you can get good at this. And so I would suggest going to Peter John's YouTube channel and taking a look at some of the really good videos he has on this. Observational data came along and said, you know, hey, these patients do better with EVT if they've got a posterior stroke. That's the... But now, now knowing the randomized control trial, knowing you didn't select them out, you can see how in the observational data, 
they may have picked out the people that they thought, maybe it was based on their imaging or something, that this person is the right person that may benefit, as opposed to, yeah, this is a devastating posterior stroke, you know, like, eh, it's not going to work, right? That's that confounding factors in observational data. But when they did the randomized control trials, they didn't find that signal of benefit, but it may have been because they weren't discriminating enough with advanced imaging. And... Um, so, uh, let's see, stroke doctors and systems want to treat patients? Yes, yeah, and so it'll be local decisions, right? So at the local level. So I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't be standing in front of a stroke neurologist saying, no, 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 and I wouldn't also be going, yeah, let's get them into the EVT suite as quick as possible for posterior strokes. At this point, the data is not that good. For anterior strokes, absolutely. The data is very good for encouraging quick and effective treatment to get those people to that therapy that can um, really change their life and make a, a good outcome.